2 Timothy 1, verse 10. Let's read it together. But is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and hath brought death and immortality to light through the gospel. The, the passage of scripture here we're dealing with, verse 10, has to do with uh, Jesus making things manifest, making the invisible manifest. Jesus is bringing things to light. Tonight, uh, you know, I, I began to think about how to illustrate this topic, put in perspective. But uh, we saw a, a, um, the, the aftermath of an accident. We saw lights, and uh, we saw we saw the um, the screeches of the tires, and we saw the uh, the uh, broken glass. We saw an accident. We saw skid marks, and we saw. Vehicles turned around, going the wrong way on the street. We saw all kinds of things that were um, out of place and uh, fluids on the ground and painted marks and there wasn't any, the, the people seemed to be okay. But it definitely was one of those accidents where you think, how on earth did that happen? There was a bus, uh, a short, one of the shorter transport buses, and, and it, would, it, it and another vehicle were both facing the wrong way. There was a car on the median and it was broken all up. And, we couldn't figure out what happened, but if we had had an eyewitness that had told us, well, this vehicle went this way, and this vehicle went that way, and this is how it happened, then we would have been able to easily understand why all the things were in place. It would have made perfect sense why these two vehicles were facing the wrong way, and why this one was on the median, and why the skid mark started on that side of the median, and not on our side. Uh, we would have, it would have all made a lot more sense. But because we didn't have anybody to explain it to us, we were just left to guess, to wonder and try to, oh, I think maybe this person started here and maybe they came across the median, and, or it could be that this person was turning and got hit and got spun around, and we, got, we, we just were trying to guess based on some marks on the road and some skid marks. So, you know, we could have used an eyewitness. We could have used a testimony. And tonight we're going to talk about Jesus bringing things to light that were, are obscure, that are hidden to our view, and because he came and because he gave us the truth, we see the things that Jesus has brought to light more clearly. So the scripture teaches us here that Jesus has brought death and immortality to light. And so that's what he is doing. But Jesus is manifesting God's plan. In our passage it says, but now is made manifest by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ. This salvation, notice verse 9 says, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling. Not according to our works, but according to his own purposes and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before the world began, but is now made manifest. That purpose and that grace is made manifest, that salvation is made manifest in Jesus Christ. And so he is now, in this time, making it manifest. I want you to turn with me to Ephesians chapter 2, and I want to show you the things that Jesus is making manifest that we did not know before. Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, and we'll look in verse 11. Ephesians chapter 2, I'll read with me here in verse 11. It says, Wherefore remember that ye, and I'm speaking to the Gentiles, ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcised by that which is called circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at the time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. And, not, and strangers from the covenants of promises, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off, are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, who hath made both one, and hath broken down the middle wall of separation. So here, this passage of scripture speaks of Jesus breaking down the wall of separation, and it says in verse 15, having abolished his flesh, in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, to make himself of the twain one new man, so making peace. And he hath reconciled both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain enmity thereby. So Jesus Christ, by his death, has taken the, uh, the Jews who were part of the covenants and promises, who received the law on Mount Sinai, who are promised the blessings and inheritance of God, he took them and he united them into one body with the Gentiles. 
and he called the Gentiles and brought them in, and they were once outside of circumcision, once outside of the covenants and promises, and have now brought into the been, been brought into the covenant of promises, and now they together become one. The two become one. And so the Jews and Gentiles inherit the kingdom together. This is great news, especially if you're a Gentile. This is great news for us all, the world that Jesus is reconciling the world to himself, not just a one group of people, but he's reconciled the whole world to himself. And so Jesus is teaching us in this passage of Scripture that through his body, he's bringing Gentiles and Jews together <coughs> into one covenant, the new covenant. He's bringing them all in, and they are all becoming his people, his chosen people. Now, this has been brought to light through the gospel. This has been brought to light by the death and burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ. This is brought to light by Jesus in the revelation of who he is and what he's done. He's bringing people unto God. And so, this is not, uh, this is somewhat of news. News. Good, big news. I mean, the Jews did not see this as the case. They did not understand this to be the case. Look with me in chapter 2 of Romans. In the book of Romans, we'll see that uh, the Jews, they have sort of a different view of how things are supposed to be. In chapter 2, we find this in verse 17. Paul is writing to three groups of people in this passage of Scripture. He writes first at this portion, he writes first to the pagans, the, those who are without God in the world, those who have no religion at all, those, those who are completely godless. Then he writes to the moralist, and then he writes to the Jew. And this is his section, writing to the Jew and teaching, showing them all that they need Jesus. Verse 17, it says, Behold, thou art called a Jew, and, res and, and uh, rested in the law, and makest thy boast of God and knoweth his will, and approveth the things that are more excellent, being instructed out of the law, and art confident that thou thyself art a guide of the blind, a light of them which are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, and teaching and a teacher of babes, which have the form of knowledge, and trusteth in the law. Therefore, which thou which teachest another, teachest thou not thyself? Thou that teachest a man should not steal, dost thou steal? Thou that saith a man should not commit adultery, dost thou commit adultery? Thou that abhorrest idols, doth thou not commit sacrilege? And so he goes on, and he begins to condemn them and say, Listen, you have the law, but you've also broken the law, and that puts you in the same position as the heathen. They are also law breakers. Even though God has given the law to the Jewish people, he has also given the, con the condemnation that goes with the law, and therefore, you are just as doomed, even though you've been given the law. And it says, verse 25, For circumcision verily profited, if, and thou be the Jew, the Jew would be circumcised, if thou keep the law. But if thou be a breaker of the law, thy circumcision is made uncircumcision. Therefore, if the uncircumcision keep, keep, keep the righteousness of the law, shall not his uncircumcision be counted for circumcision. And shall not the uncircumcision, which is by nature, if it fulfill the law, judge thee who by the letter and circumcision doth transgress the law. For he is not a Jew which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, and not in the letter. Whose praise is not of men, but of God. And Paul goes on to illustrate that all men are sinners. And he's saying that you may be circumcised in the flesh, and you may have the covenants and promises as a people, but that doesn't mean that inwardly you are a Jew, according to the Scriptures. He's talking about the Jew, the Jew in the sense of having received the deep covenant of God, the, the, new, the new covenant. The covenant that comes in Christ. He says you've got the old covenant, but you need the new covenant, the one that's in Christ. And so when he speaks of this as this, the this spiritual relationship with God wherein their sins have been forgiven and they've been uh, saved, and so he says, this is that which has been brought to light through the death and burial and resurrection of Christ, that it is not enough just to be born into a certain family. It is not enough just to have been given the laws of God. But something has to change in your heart. There has to be more than circumcision in the outward flesh. There has to be circumcision in the heart. That cutting away, that doing, putting away of the filth of the flesh. 
and that heart change that becomes um, where a man becomes different. There is a new relationship. He made one body out of two people. Not, no longer Jews and Gentiles, but one group, one of us, all together in Christ, one church, he's called us out. So this is new revelation. This is something that we understand now because of the New Testament. And we understand that uh, God is doing a new work. He's not just dealing with the people of Israel and bringing them under a theocracy. He is bringing, <coughs> excuse me, he is bringing people to himself through the death, the burial, and resurrection of Christ. This is new revelation, and it makes us all happy. We all have something that we can find in the scriptures. This is wonderful because it doesn't do any harm to the Jewish people. You see, the Jewish people have not become less Jewish because Jesus made a covenant with them under the new covenant. But he has forgiven their sins. And he, they don't have, they're not less of a people. It doesn't harm them. It doesn't do away with them. It changes their relationship with God, and they can all be saved. And we can be saved. We can all be saved together. We have the righteousness that comes in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. It doesn't hurt anybody, but it helps us all. And so we have a great revelation. And that also tells us that this is the last day. You know, the, the, the Lord is going to come back. This is the end of all things. This is the last of all, the revelation that Jesus has um, uh, in our passage. It says that he's made manifest, and the appearing, and by, by manifesting himself, he is now, um, uh, by the appearing of our Savior, he's making these things manifest. He's done this, he's made, made this revelation to us. He has shown us what is the truth that everything is in Christ. We don't need a new prophet. We don't need a new revelation. He's revealed it to us. It's in Jesus Christ. It's in our New Testament. You know, the Mormons, they teach that Joseph Smith was a prophet of God. And that he came along and he revealed more truth. Listen, in Christ is revealed all things. Everything necessary for life and godliness is in Christ. And death and immortality has been brought to light. And so we can now see it. We don't need a new revelation. We don't need further prophets. We don't need anyone to show us anything new. We need Christ. Amen. We need Christ. And that's all we need is our, new, is our New Testament. We need Christ. And therefore, we are happy to have uh, this passage of Scripture to tell us that it's in Christ. The appearing of Jesus has revealed everything we need to know. We don't need a new prophet. We don't need a new uh, relationship. We don't need a new uh, uh, person to come along. We don't need a word from God that's come from heaven. We have the word of God contained in our Bible, in the New Testament. We have our book we can open up and we can find out what God has said. So then it says here in verse 10 that he's abolished death. He's abolished death. Now, I suppose if you could say what... Uh, what would become of this world if there was no more death? No death at all. Then, I suppose for some people, that would be the worst news ever. Because, you know, death is uh, longed for by some people. They're in so much pain, and they're so miserable, and their life is so hard, that if they were to have to live forever like that, it would be complete misery to them. So, death is, some, in some way, a relief. But for other people, that would be great. They would like to be, to be able to live forever. But that's not exactly what's being meant here. It's not physical death that God is speaking of, but it is spiritual death. He's abolishing the spiritual death. Death. There is corruption that comes with death. There is ruin that comes with death. There is separation from God that comes with death. And in Christ, He has abolished the spiritual death that man finds himself in. When Adam sinned, all men died in Adam. And, Adam, and when Adam sinned, man was separated from God. And all of Adam's posterity is born dead in sin, trespasses, and is separated from the life of God. In light of that, we find that God is uh, not God, uh, he, he's not in man. He's not dwelling in a spirit. So man needs God. He's without God in this world. And it is a state of spiritual death. The Bible says we're dead in trespasses and sins. And being dead... We need life. We need life. We need life to give us uh, the power to live for God. We need life to give us the strength to do what the, the Word of God says. But 
This is a state of corruption and ruin. It's spiritual and physical. There's death all around. There's death everywhere. We see it all around us, and Christ has come to abolish death. You know, death is a great enemy. Death is that enemy that says, oh, I don't know what's going to happen to me when I die. Death is that, that, uh, that which lurks in the background, always behind us, not knowing what's going to happen. We are, we, some people are very afraid of death, don't know what's going to happen to them. They lay in bed at night, not knowing what's going to come, become of them. And yet, in Christ, since He died, and He took our place, when we believe upon Him, He becomes our substitute. And we don't have to any longer fear death. We can stand in the face of death and say, death is going to be a, a, a welcome and encouraging and exciting transition for me. I'm going to move from here to glory. I'm going to go from this earth to my new home. It is going to be a step up. And therefore, death no longer has to be something to be feared, but it can be a friend. It can be a great friend to us because we can look forward to the day in which we die. Which, uh, Paul said, for me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. Gain. He was going to gain from it. And why is he going to gain from it? It's because he is able to then walk hand in hand with his Savior. Face to face, he is going to see him as he is. He's going to rejoice in the blessing of knowing his personal presence with God. We are enjoying the life of God after we die. Together, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Present with Christ. That's what death is. Enjoy the presence of Jesus. It is a sting. Paul says that death, he says, Oh, death, where is thy victory? Oh, grave, where is thy sting? Did I say that right? Oh, grave, where is thy victory? Oh, death, where is thy sting? And he says that death has a great sting. But Jesus died in our place. He died for us. And so He has abolished death for us. So that when you die, you do not die. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. If you believe upon me, you'll never die. Never die. Now, I, I know that all Christians up to this point have died. All the ones that have lived before us, and the rest of them are on the waiting list. They're all going to die. But that's not the death he's talking about. He said, when though they are dead, yet shall they live. And that is a great encouragement to us as Christians. You, when you die, you are not dead. When you die, you move on, and you live, and you live eternally. And so this is a wonderful um, revelation to us. You see, when Jesus died, he wasn't dead. He died upon the cross, and his physical body was absolutely dead. But he was not dead. His soul left his body, and his body was buried in a tomb, but Jesus wasn't in that tomb. Just his body. And when he left the tomb, and when he left the tomb, he was gone for three days. And for three nights, he wasn't in his body. Because Jesus received a body that he lived in, but he was alive before the body, and he died, and he didn't need the body to live. He said, Well, that's news. You don't need your body to live. You say, well, if I don't have my body, I'll die. Yes, you'll die physically, but you are not your body. Your body is just the house in which you live. Your body is just the, the shell in which the nut lives. The, uh, the, the, you are inside of your body, spiritually, uh, not in a material sense, but when you die, something leaves and leaves behind the shell. And that's what we find in the scriptures from Jesus Christ, because his body was in that tomb, but he was not there. So we find him gone. Three days, three nights, life and immortality being brought to life. And their death has taken, it's, he's taken that sting of death for us. And now the law cannot threaten us any longer. It doesn't have power over us anymore. The, the, the Bible says the wages of sin is death. And the penalty for breaking the law of God is to die. But the suffering and the resurrection of Christ shows us that He has taken that death for us. He's defeated the foe. It's a, it's a foe that has been defeated by Christ. So we have the blessing of knowing that He has defeated death. He's taken that for us. And we know that our future has a settled, our future rewards. They're a settled fact. 
the, by abolishing death, we know that when the day comes of our death, it is not going to be ill with us, but it's going to go well with us. Because God has given us His promises in Christ. So then we find this last portion of Scripture here. It says, Who has saved us, let's see, verse 10, but is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to light. What Jesus has done is he's brought death and immortality to light. He has pulled back the curtain on what happens on the other side. What we see when we look at the life of Christ and the teachings of Christ and the message of the Lord Jesus, we see life as it really is. And let me give you just a few ways in which the curtains have been pulled back. He's brought death and immortality to light. Let me just tell you a few things that he's shown us. He's shown us life and what it really is. Death and immortality to light. You know, Jesus Christ shows us what it's like to really live. He lived in such a way as he lived to have dependence upon his Father. And the Holy Spirit of God gave him his life. His life started with God. And his life, uh, lived, he lived under the power of the Holy Spirit. He was a man, but he yielded himself up body and soul unto the Lord. He was a man, but he yielded himself body and soul to the Holy Spirit of God dwelling in him. All the work in the New Testament done by Christ, he attributes it to the power and the working of the Holy Spirit. He said, Without, he said, my Father and I work. He said, I work and my Father works. And he did the work and the work he said he did was not him doing it, but his Father working in him. And so we realize that Jesus has brought life to light. That's how we're to live. We're to live by the power of the Holy Spirit. How are you going to get the Christian life lived and done? You're going to do it the same way Jesus did it, by yielding your life up to the power of the Holy Spirit. You won't accomplish anything without that. That's what Jesus revealed to us. Just as He was yielded to His Father, so you must be yielded to the Savior. Just as He gave Himself up to do the will of the Father, so must you. Just as He lived day by day by the power of the Holy Spirit within Him, so must you. That is this, the message of the life of Christ. It started with God, and there's no life without the presence of God. You're going to have life and light brought, uh, you're going to have uh, immort immortality and life brought to light by the person Jesus Christ. That's how he lived, and that's how you must live. And then we also see what death really is. We see not only what life is, but we see what death is. Turn with me to Luke chapter 16. I mentioned this passage this morning, Luke 16. In Luke 16, we see what death really is. And in verse 19, it says, There was a certain rich man, which was clothed in purple and fine linen, and fared fair sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at the gate full of sores, and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the, the, the rich man's table, moreover the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died, and was carried away by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. Now how would you know that Lazarus was carried away by angels? Unless Jesus told you. Jesus said it. He pulled back the curtain. He showed us what happened. The angels came, and they carried him away. Now, verse 22, it says, The rich man also died and was buried. Now, where is the rich man? He said, well, he's in the grave. He was buried. There he lays. There's the casket. There's the body. And they put him right there in the ground. And he was buried. And it says, verse 23, And in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torments. Now, how would you know that to be the case? How would you know that his body can be in one place, but his eyes somewhere else? His body can be in another place, but his head, to lift up those eyes, are somewhere else. And the man cried and said, Father Abraham. You see that in verse 24, he cried. How would you know he could cry out? If Jesus didn't tell us it's the case, he showed death and immortality and brought them to life. He showed us what death looks like. He has revealed it by pulling back the curtains and showing us this is what it looks like on the other side. You would not be able to know. 
and people say, well, this is just a parable and it's illustrative of other things. Listen, if this kind of stuff doesn't happen, then Jesus is speaking of fairy tales. Jesus is telling us stories about things that don't happen. You know, his other stories are things like mustard seeds, uh, sheep, coins. His other stories have to do with harvesting, planting. All of his other parables have to do with things such as the word of God and the seed. And then you get to this parable and his story is about hell and it doesn't exist. Listen, that's not how Jesus teaches. He doesn't use things that don't exist to teach his word. He doesn't use things that don't exist to tell us about God. And therefore we see that this is a powerful illustration of what hell looks like. Life without God. Life without God. What does it look like? This is what it looks like. Then we see immortality. He brought life. He brought death. He brought immortality all to life. Back in 2 Corinthians, I mean 2 Timothy. Back in 2 Timothy. We see the immortality brought to life. He says in verse 10, he's brought death and immortality to life. This has all happened through the gospel. Through the gospel. He's brought it in, he brought it through the gospel. In the gospel, what we see is the same thing Paul talks about. Paul said that he spoke to uh, Felix, I believe it was Felix, about judgment and self-control. And he spoke to him so much so that Felix trembled. He trembled. He shook. Now, I don't know how many soul winners speak about judgment and self-control until their hearers tremble. You know, a lot of times this is what our soul winning has to do with. It has to do with telling somebody, you're a sinner. You understand that? Yes or no? Yes, I understand. Okay, now Jesus died to pay for that sin. You understand that? Yes or no? Yes, I understand it. And here's the passage in the book of Romans that says it. And then here's what you do. You go and believe on Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. And they say, okay, I believe that. And they, they pray a prayer with you. Now, they may or may not get saved, but the way Paul talked to Felix, Felix trembled. And he talked to Felix about self-control. And you know, if your gospel presentation doesn't lend itself to speaking about self-control at all, then you're not preaching the gospel. If you aren't able to explain how the gospel and self-control are so intimately connected that you must speak about it. It doesn't mean that you speak about it every time. But you ought to be able to share the gospel in such a way as that self-control is brought up. Self-control. Now, how would self-control be weaved into the gospel? Well, there's a judgment day coming. And all of your deeds are going to be judged. Even your idle words are going to be judged. And if you have no self-control, then you are, uh, which is a fruit of the Holy Spirit within you, then you evidence a sinful and carnal nature. And that carnal nature does what it wants to do. And as it does what it wants to do, it will drive, it'll, it'll drive you towards hell. And your self-control will be your, your lack of self-control will be your ruin. You do what you know is wrong. And therefore, we see there's a judgment day. He's bringing this to light through the gospel. The gospel tells us there's not only a judgment day, but there is a heaven and a hell. The gospel, there's going to be a heaven and a hell. There are saints and there are angels. There is a return of Christ. A second coming. Jesus is on his way back. There's eternal happiness to those who get saved. And eternal misery to those who are, those who are lost. These things are all contained in the gospel. Jesus Christ died because you're a sinner. According to the gospel. He died for your sins, which are many, because you have, uh, you have a rebellious heart. He not only died for your sins, but you're going to be judged if you don't receive the payment, the burial and resurrection of Christ as your own, as a substitute for your own. And Jesus is coming back to take his own. He's coming back to collect those who are his. He's brought all these things to light through the gospel. And we were able to see that there is eternal happiness that awaits us. In Christ. In Christ, all these things are brought to light. So what, is, what do we have in Christ? We have the great rollback of the other side. 
How will we know anything that has happened, or will happen, or what will happen in the next life? We have Christ, and He shows it to us by His life, by His words, by our New Testament. We see Jesus Christ, and we see light. Uh, excuse me, we see light, and we see immortality, and we see all these things in Christ. And it's a wonderful, beautiful picture. Amen. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for this night. We ask for your blessing. We thank you, Lord, that you have given us life, light, and immortality. You've given us uh, a view of the other side. You brought it all to life, by, to light by your own existence, by your life, by the way you lived it. You lived in independence upon your Father. And by the Spirit of God. Now we ask for your blessing, Lord Jesus. Teach us to not only know the light, but to enjoy the light. To walk in the light as you are in the light. In Jesus' name.